two. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm Rosie Samter. I'm the violist and director of the Dairy String Quartet. And I am joined tonight by Mateus. Uh, I'm not going to say all your names. Mateus. Uh, Sergio Garcia Souza. Yes, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I collect less names. That's what I do. Like Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta catch them all. And then our random mystery character here is Eli Bishop. So thank you, Eli, for joining us. <laughs> thank you. We communicated about it and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> for some great dynamic. <laughs> so obviously the best um the best takeaway from this panel is already that dad jokes help communication um <laughs> as well as hiding jokes to... they were hearing hiding oh. right before we came in <laughs> oh nice i didn't realize that yeah i didn't either <laughs> yes um well so we're here um to talk about group dynamics and effective communication and um this is something that I feel very, very strongly about and for, for a very good reason. And, I, and I'm just gonna start out by saying that I, I started a string quartet. I now work in a string quartet, but I hated playing chamber music. Like I, it was one of the worst things for me. And it wasn't until I was in my last year at a graduate program at the Boston Conservatory and I was in a chamber music group and we were playing a Beethoven string quartet. And the coach did not work on music with us at all because we knew how to work on the music. We could practice, we could play, we could, we could you know, figure out articulations and bowings. But what we couldn't do was talk to each other and communicate with each other in a way that, that we all could leave without wanting to kill each other. Huh. And that was really the first time that I really realized how much I love chamber music. And a lot of that is because it is so intimate and it is so vulnerable. But in order to be that vulnerable, you really have to feel safe in what you're saying. And you really have to not say things that, that people can take the wrong way. <laughs> Words are incredibly powerful and we have to be really careful with how we use them. And not take anything so. for granted. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. The one thing that you assume like, oh, this person will know what I'm talking about. That's the one thing that might ruin your entire point, your entire argument and everything that you <laughs> wanted to communicate. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think like I'm just going to to that that same coach, his name is Lenny Machinsky. He was a viola teacher at the Boston Conservatory. He was not my teacher. I play viola, but he um, he was just my chamber music coach. And I think one of the biggest, like one of the things he said that had the most impact to me was, um, it's very typical in string quartets that we all have our shining moments, our solos. And it's very standard for people to all comment and chime in and say like, oh, you should play it this way. Like, how many times have you been told to play your solo a specific way, Eli? Oh, yeah. Too many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Lenny told us as a group, he's like, you, you don't get to say that. That's not okay. And it just kind of like... And all of us were, you know, like we sat there, we're like, well, we should get it. We should get to say, we should get to say something because we're in this group. Like we are a part of this group. And Lenny said, the second you tell someone how to play their solo, you're telling them you're better than they are. And you know, their instrument more than they do. And that kind of was what really made me start to really think about how our words can be used in ways we don't necessarily mean them to or want them to, and how we have to be so vigilant in what we say, in order to say what we mean and, and really not have everybody leave the room upset. <laughs> it is interesting because the, the, the different instrument also translates to different violins. Like you can, you can be talking <laughs> about the same instrument, but each violin responds so differently and the setup can change so much from not even the instrument itself and the strings and the bow, but also like 
some people like to use a shoulder rest that is really high. Some people use no shoulder rest and they use just a little pad. Some people use a, a chin rest that is also like high and some people use some that are low, some that are in the middle, some at the side. So it, it changes so much, you know, even if you say like, well, yeah, I play violin. It doesn't mean that you can literally like pick up anyone's violin and sound exactly how you want. Yes. And also things work different on different instruments. So it's like things that you can play very easily on violin are not always easy to play on the viola. Oh my because... gosh. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh yeah. So, we once did a stream where we like rotated instruments and like Oh I forgot about <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, and that one stream Chris was playing violin well and, and he was, you know, we rotated instruments and the instrument that he complained the most about was my violin. <laughs> like he, he picked up the cello and was like, oh yeah, this is weird, you know? And we uh, we obviously sounded terrible, you know, in every every time we changed instruments, but like he complained the most. It was a most... good terrible though. Yeah, it was. It was fun terrible. I mean, it was fun. <laughs> but, but yeah, so that really made me start thinking about how other about other how to use other words in ways that in a sense are more inclusive and less exclusive. And so uh, one that I, I like to, to say all the time, I'm sure Eli and Mateus have heard this a million times, is that instead of singling someone out, because at the end of the day, when you play in a group, you, you're not just you. You're more than you. You are the group. And so we often talk about the fifth person in the quartet and that fifth person is the quartet. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to forget about yourself and forget about your ego and all of those things. Just check it at the door and suddenly you are the group. So things happen. People play out of tune. We like it, it happens, especially in rehearsal. That's the time you fix things. And you also, have to out address of tune it. Is extremely relative. <laughs> I just have to oh my really, gosh. I, we just have to establish that from the get go that out of tune is a hundred percent relative. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Which makes it so important never to single someone out and say, Oh, I'm just going to Eli, forgive me. I'm just going to use you as my example. <laughs> um, but it would be like, Eli, your B is really flat. Hey now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it's like, and when you're with, with a group of people, like suddenly that person is called out, that person is on the defensive. And instead of saying your B is out of flat, because it's not just Eli's B, this is our B. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> also, say, like, Eli will oh. never respond like that. Eli would be like, <laughs> no, oh man, was my B really flat? Oh, oh gosh, darn it. <laughs> and then and then he tried That's to true. fix it, but it's not like n no, it, it's you know it may have not been his fault. Yeah, it's it's really it's a group thing, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So own it as a group, and instead of saying you were out of tune, say we were out of tune. Let's let's fix it. <laughs> and hey, no. that does a few things because this actually happened to me. It went in like Videri was at a summer festival, and we were rehearsing like eight hours a day, and. Um, the viola, a lot of times in a quartet, has the the color note. So it's it's the note that doesn't have to be. It, it's like it's the note that you know the third of a chord. A lot of times are like the the seventh. So it's like it, there's different levels of where you can put it to make it in tune. <laughs> so it's like you can make it really sharp, or you can make it a little less sharp, depending on what what you're going for. And it varies and a lot. <laughs> it does vary, and it varies person to person like my preference could be completely different from Eli's or Mateus's or Jeremiah's we need to include him even though he's not here yeah, he's right here <laughs> it's true he's he's with us in Sprite <laughs> I um, can hear what you guys are saying I sorry. can hear what you're talking about me oh he's, there he is yeah <laughs> sorry Jeremiah oh, Jeremiah <laughs> hi um so I got completely got derailed there. My attention span is like a gnat. <laughs> but, um, so, but knowing that that different things, people have different feelings about different things. I was constantly being told what to do 
by all the other members of the quartet and not in a way that was malevolent. They were, you know, that we were really trying to get the best sound. But after like a week of being told that you're wrong constantly, hmm. I didn't, I was scared to play my instrument. And we ended up like having a big fight and it wasn't about that. It was, it was about just, I don't even, it was probably about something incredibly dumb. And we had to like all sit down and talk. And it had gotten to the point where I was afraid to say anything because whenever I said a word in the rehearsal, people would just argue with me. Mm. So I was at a point where it's like, I'm being told, I, I was doubting myself as a player because I was constantly being told how to play my instrument and how to place the intonation. And I was constantly being argued with. Like any, you know, I'd be like, oh, could we, could we play a down bow here? And someone else in the quartet would say like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. What is, and it's like, what is well, interesting is, is like, I feel like what, what most people have as a natural instinct is to be like, well, I'm going to tell this person what they did wrong. So then they can, they can get better and they will get better if I do that, because obviously that's the way that they get better. But it really works in the opposite way like you telling the person that they're doing something wrong will only make them play worse <laughs> and from like years of experience is like you you know i i always notice i played the best um and i feel the best and i play the best with the people that um have these good communication skills that uh they know how to say something in a way that they don't tell me like oh you should do this solo like this or you should do it like that but in but rather they they just go like oh man i really like this one thing that you did ah can we go back and try this from some whatever place and try this again and then you know and then maybe they will do something differently that will make me react in a way that i'll be like oh this person is doing that now Maybe I can try this other thing, which maybe it was that person's idea from the start, you know, but the, the person didn't go like, oh, do it like that. You know, instead, the person, uh, you know, complimented me and uh, lifted my spirits up saying like, hey, <laughs> you're you're doing the thing that you do and it's awesome. And then, you know, um, it, that only makes you play better. Anyway. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, ca I can't absolutely. agree with that more, really. <laughs> So, um, and I did want to, you know, like when we got together for this panel, it was very, you know, we're like, we're going to talk about communication. We don't have like, it's not scripted at all because in my opinion, it doesn't really need to be, and it shouldn't be, but it should just, again, communication. But one of the things I definitely wanted to talk about, and I really, as soon as, as like, I've been dreaming about doing this panel <laughs> and Eli and Mateus can probably back that up for like two or three years now. I've wanted to talk about these things and I really wanted to have Mateus here because Mateus doesn't speak English as a first language. I, I don't. Some days I don't even speak all. English. <laughs> <laughs> some days I just can't. <laughs> I'm like, what is that word? And the other person goes like, uh, chair. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> chair. <laughs> <laughs> but when Mateus joined the group one thing that happened first off when you listen to Mateus talk you would never know that he has any struggles with English because it's very good <laughs> yeah I'm a good actor and he you fooled me into a, a a sense of a false sense of I don't know I guess like not being clear you you I became muddy but uh, when Videri, you know, Chris and Videri, or sorry, Chris and Mateus joined Videri at the same time. And so we all sat down and we talked and it's like, we, we had these great conversations about what we expected and what we wanted. And we would do that. But then there start it's like, there started to be some tension. And so we, we did, we had a check-in and it turned out that we all had completely different understandings of what we meant. And we had to go back and it was like, okay, let's just be as basic as possible. Like in a sense, you have to check, you, you know, like you, you, you get rid of all of these, like, oh, I don't want to say this because it might hurt someone's feelings. It's you come into it with, 
all the things that are going to be said in this room are for the betterment of the group. And you don't single people out or attack people. Mm -hmm. And you use very simple, very basic language. And that's actually something I learned. I work in special education as well. And I used to work a lot with children who had autism. And I read this book. I want to say the title is 10 Things Your Child with Autism Wants You to Know. And I remember one thing from this book, and it was, do not be vague. Like, don't. And so my, the, the example that, that they give, which I love, is if you tell a child who struggles with, you know, who wants black and white answers, who wants very specific answers, if you tell them to wait here, most of us would understand what here means. But if you don't, like, if you're anxious about that word here, like, where is here? There's really no, you have not defined where here is. And so instead, if you say, wait in this room, you've, you've said exactly what you want. There's nothing that can be inferred from that. So, well, I mean, I'm sure that <laughs> some of my little violin students would be able to argue with me on that because they find every loophole. <laughs> <laughs> But realizing that you have to get rid of all of those inferences because not everybody is going to, to understand them the same as you do. Because first off, Eli, where were you born? Nashville. Yeah. And you, were, you grew up and born and raised in Nashville, right? Nashville, Mateus, what about you? I was born in Brazil, in Londrina, Brazil. Yep. And raised. I was born in Idaho. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's right. you. you were born in Idaho. <laughs> In the middle of the horses. Yeah, I was and born and raised in Idaho, in the middle of nowhere. So every single one of us come from insanely different backgrounds with insanely different, I, I'm going to say it, insanely different cultures because, like, yeah. it's just very different. So you can't assume that people understand what you're saying. I have Unless to say, you are Rosie's dad weird. is a blacksmith. How cool is that? <laughs> I, I literally yeah, tell that awesome. to everybody that I meet. And then. <laughs> He made me this little bracelet that I wear all the time. And then people were like, look, it's like, oh, this is cool. And I'm like, yeah, my friend's dad made it. He's a blacksmith. How cool is that? Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For Christmas one year, I collect Briar model horses, which you can see above my window. I have like 80 of them, which is insane. I recognize that. Um, <laughs> he, made, he made one of my horses a full set of armor one year. <laughs> so it's this little tiny horse with full armor anyway <laughs> not necessarily <laughs> all about communication <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> but anyway it, this is a very good like yes i grew up with a blacksmith as a father i don't know anyone else who can say that <laughs> yep <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna yeah, dispute yeah. on that <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's really awesome <laughs> <clears throat> So do you guys want to say something? I, the other thing that I have realized about myself is that I talk a lot. And so I, I have to take space and give other people a chance to talk. <laughs> oh. um, do you guys want to add to any of that? Yeah, I feel like... I'm still trying to get over the fact that your dad's a blacksmith. I forgot about that. Like, I remember, <laughs> years, I remember years ago, you know, well, I, when I first joined the dairy, when you first started it and everything, like, I remember shortly after I moved back to Nashville and we, you know, talked about how it just didn't work to do it at that time with everything. I remember the Banner Saga video coming out <laughs> and, like, all this awesome stuff you had done, like, with your family. And in, in, was that in Idaho? Did you do it there? Did they come to well, Boston? Or? So it was, it was in Washington State which is okay, okay, like gotcha. technically Idaho. It's like that, you know, cause I grew up in the panhandle, which okay. it's either 40 or 60 miles across. There's nothing almost there. as remote. It's, well, and yeah, so it's like, it, we really, we drove to Spokane, which was like where we could find a videographer and where we could get all of, I can't believe I'm saying this, but all of my father's Viking friends. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you were just like, yeah, this is something we did. <laughs> I'm like, how did you get all this stuff? Where did all this come from? <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I always have the best Halloween outfit. I can break out. My dad made me a chain mail top and I have a cloak and it's ridiculous. 
It's incredible. <laughs> so I think I cut Mateus off though when I started saying that. I'm sorry. What were you? No, about I, to say? I I have nothing really important to say except that I was. I think what I was gonna say is, um, yeah, it, it is it is interesting and super important to keep this open communication channel, you know, um, between your ensemble members, and, and then you you end up finding out, you know, um, like what every every person's strengths are. And, you know, that's the best thing. And then, like, you know, from that point on, it's literally you're constantly learning from each other. And um, I think I think that's the best best thing in any group is um, whenever you you can get together with people who you get along with and you're constantly learning from each other. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think one thing you said, Mateus, that I really kind of latched on to was learn each other's weaknesses uh, yeah. because I will say the one thing that I have ha that, that I have learned from being in a quartet is to walk into a room and just say how I'm feeling <laughs> <laughs> so instead of trying to hide like and and I do this now when I come home I have two roommates and I'll come home and I'll be like I'm really cranky and they'll just be like okay <laughs> and it's, it's just you know, especially when you are in a situation where you have like high pressure, high stress situations, it's really important to let everybody know that you aren't comfortable, that you are maybe feeling a little anxious, that something maybe went wrong. Because if you don't tell them, they know, <laughs> they just don't know what. And whenever somebody is kind of left in the dark, there is, there's this, you know, like it's, there's anxiety mm -hmm. and that 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 gets into your plane of course you know and the it's, first it's, thing you, you do is you think like oh man like what what was it in my plane that upset this person <laughs> again yes <laughs> or what something like that you? you know yeah <laughs> yeah what and, did i do <laughs> so and again like every time Matei says things i'm reminded of more things i want to say um, one thing that that we've done in the quartet, and I love this, and I actually learned this from working as a as a teacher, is um, we have the red card rule, and at any time during rehearsal, anyone can just say red card, and we stop rehearsing and we all leave the room, and we try to go to five, like four different places so that we don't see each other, we're not talking to each other, and we just take like depending on how much time is needed, like five to 10 minutes of just like being alone, be, you know, just doing something to like calm yourself down or even just like take a break. And then we just come back and we rehearse and it's like nothing happened. Like you don't talk about it. You just move on. And <clears throat> what that allows, that allows each member to take a break for whatever reason with no judgment. And what I have discovered is that whenever I've had to use that or wanted to use that, it's not because somebody else said something. It's because I'm so frustrated with myself that I can't keep, I cannot be part of the group, like an effective part of the group. And that that's one thing that I I, I feel like we're taught as musicians. And, and I mean, I, this could just be my opinion, but I feel like we're taught that making a mistake is this huge, terrible, terrible thing and you should never admit to it and you should just like pretend it didn't happen. And so it's like when you make a mistake, it's like for myself, it's, it's just like the snowball effect where it's like, oh, I made that mistake. And then I'm thinking about it and it's just it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Mm. Yeah. And it's interesting because so... we usually we are usually the first ones to notice that we made a mistake. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, yeah, I think. Technically and theoretically, we are the first ones to know that we made, made a mistake, right? Because we're the closest ones to our <laughs> instrument, and it it is really weird. And it, um and now you know ever ever since last year when um we started just like recording remotely way more, um and uh yeah. you know you get to hear your own recordings like the, the the own your own playing from the microphone, um you start noticing that like sometimes you're 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 recording a take. And then you think to yourself, ah, the, I, this shift was terrible and it sounded, 
you know, horrible and, you know, I'll definitely have to do this spot again and whatever. And then you stop and you go and you listen back and then you go and you think, wait, it didn't sound as bad as it felt, <laughs> like not nearly as bad as it felt, you know. Um, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if other people mm -hmm. relate to that, but I think like classical string <laughs> musicians are like the utmost, <laughs> like, I don't know, um, harsh critics of, of, of each other. Also, I wonder if yes. like that. Uh, I wonder if like that red card rule, um, if it was applied to orchestra, for example, <laughs> that would be pretty cool. <laughs> like anybody oh in orchestra just be like red card, <laughs> and then like just I everybody mean, leaves. <laughs> it'd be abused for sure. Yeah, I was gonna say. I feel like, well, and again, like that that brings up the entire the entire thing of trust, where it's like we're going back to, you know, it's like, we, we have to trust each other. We have to feel safe. We have to, we have to be able to communicate and like knowing that people aren't going to abuse the red card is one of, one of the, the trust issues. Yeah. So. Right. Oh, I'm getting all these, I need to turn off all my notifications. <laughs> but <clears throat> yeah, sometimes you have, you do have the opposite experience when you record. <laughs> it's like, when you're like, oh, but oh. And like sometimes you get so, weird glitches too when you like record something and you listen back and you're like, what? Why does it sound like there's a bad edit here? I didn't even edit. <laughs> totally, totally, yeah. Have you ever have you ever retracted something because it sounds like there was an edit even though there, it wasn't? All the time, and I think it's like okay. it, it's I think it's a mixture of like you know like reverberation, especially if you're using like ribbon mics, right? Because they they're like figure eight pattern right and then you know like i i don't know it's so weird <laughs> yeah yeah i've definitely retracted stuff because i'm like that's not an edit but the person if they hear that they're gonna think i cut it there and i can't <laughs> i can't have that happen yes it's so, so funny you mentioned that yeah i i honestly think that so right when quarantine happened a year ago today to the date today wow. is the anniversary I also got my first dose of my vaccine today and I'm super excited. So Ooh, that's how awesome. I celebrated a year of COVID. Um, I, we, we, Videri um, recorded an album, a completely remote album when, when COVID hit. And that's when Eli came back and joined us remotely. Um, and I think, I think everyone should record a remote album. And the reason I say this, not because it was fun, it was not necessarily fun. <laughs> not all the time. Sometimes it was fun. <laughs> but I, it really makes you focus on yourself and mm -hmm. realize that it's like, oh, I can't just hide this here. Like, it really matters when I play all the right notes. <laughs> um, but one thing about that album is it, it really, it forced us into a different communication style, which was kind of fun actually i actually liked that part of it where it's like we had to be in constant communication even though we were working separately and yeah. so that then it becomes more of like it's not even necessarily using the correct words but more of like making sure you continue the dialogue yeah because it's so easy when you're not in a room with people to be like oh i have to go make dinner oh i have to you know like so many other like so many things that are right in front of you come up and so to continue a group through something like this pandemic you have to stay in, con in constant convert constant dialogue mm -hmm. really yeah yeah absolutely and and then back to the music stuff too like all of the things that come up when you're rehearsing live don't come up until you've recorded a part and then you hear it and you think oh <laughs> I, I kind of wish I had phrased it a little. I can retract that because I want to phrase it more like Mateus did, or I want to match, you know, I want to match Rosie more on this. And then, you know, then everybody's sitting there listening to each other. It's like, it's like a much more delayed version of the in in person rehearsal. It's crazy. Yeah. Bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And and again, I just thought of this. Like go again, going back to weaknesses. Like that that one is really. I I think that one is the hardest one it's it's really hard to admit that you're vulnerable especially to people who you know it's like i i get to play with pretty great musicians like i don't want to let them down <laughs> mm. so it's like you know when you make a mistake or you know like 
life happens and you don't always get to get in all the practice that you want. So it's like, there is no worse feeling than walking into rehearsal without your part learned. And again, the best thing to do in that situation is just to say like, I'm really sorry, guys, this happened. You know, it's like, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying don't do that all the time, but it happens. Be honest about it. <laughs> yeah. Right. And how do we but, all stay like, in contact? It's a mixture of Slack and Facebook Messenger. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, a few times we Zoom call. It's, I mean, like I can't oh, yeah. tell you how nice it is to see people's faces and Discord. that I haven't got to see. <laughs> like the first Zoom call we had, I was like, "Oh my god, I miss you guys so much." Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you guys still exist in person yeah. somewhere. Yeah. But. I, I like the, the, the weakness and strength uh, talk. And I, I, I think one of my favorite analogies is like, you need, you need to always be aware of both of, of the strengths and weaknesses. And um, I like the analogy that compares, um, you know, your whatever project or skill that you're regarding as, you know, a sailboat. And then um, your strengths are basically your sail, which will, you know, allow you to go far. The thing that you go like and you learn from each other, like everybody's strengths, that's what is going to take you far. But it's always also important to um, know your weaknesses, which uh, in this case are like little holes that you may have in your boat. So it, it doesn't mean that, the, you know, the holes will sink your boat immediately. But, you know, if they are not paid attention to if they're not tend to then um you know yeah you you may sink <laughs> in in you know in yeah. some time but yeah. you know uh th that's the thing you have to always like be be aware of your strengths and you know um and those will take you far and at the same time you know patch little holes when you can um and uh, and be aware and how you can work on, on the weaknesses you know yeah and and even going you know like by taking care of your holes <clears throat> again it's it 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 isn't it is not Eli's job to read my mind and know if I'm having a bad day. It is my job to say that. <laughs> yep. Sure. And so it and and again like that comes down to the vulnerability. But then like for me, like I I have had to, you know, it's like you end up having to share, not having to, but you end up sharing like very very intimate and personal details like um there was one concert we played in new york and it was probably like two hours before the concert um my mom called and <laughs> i love my mom <laughs> but she called and she's like is this a good time to talk and i was like well not really i'm just about to play a concert and she's like oh well then i'll tell you later and i was like yeah. now now you can't like yeah. that's <laughs> again, the worst. like now now you have to tell me yeah and it, it turned out that one of my best friends, her younger brother had committed suicide. And this was, this was someone I grew up with. And it's like, I used to babysit him. Mm. And it's like, it threw me completely. And Mateus was actually with me at the time. And so he, like, I told him, but I was like, I don't want to tell Jeremiah and Chris, like, I don't want to, I don't want to tell them. I don't want to burden them with that. And after, like, it, I think it was in the middle of the, like at intermission, Chris was like, are you okay? What's up? And it's like, you can't hide it. And it's like, it's, you know, I, I was trying to, I, I guess, protect, I, I don't even know if it was trying to protect them or really just trying to show that I was, that I could handle it or that it, it or like that I could still through. play the concert. Yeah. When I, I really just needed to let the rest of the, the quartet help me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so realizing that, you know, like those holes aren't going to patch themselves. Like what, but when you all talk together and when you, when you trust everyone, they'll take care of you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, these guys absolutely. will. I don't know about <laughs> the rest of your groups. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, so I, I mean, after I decided I did like chamber music, I, um, I ended up doing a residency at the Banff Center. And while I was there, that's when I really realized that I wanted to be in a quartet. This was pre-Fideri. And um, so every string quartet that came through, I would like 
try to become friends with them and just talk to them about like, what is it like being in a string quartet? And the best answer was, it's it's like being married to three people. <laughs> and it's actually when you get older and you start to, you know, like have partners, it, it ends up being more like married to, let's see, how many is this? Seven other people? <laughs> like, and so you suddenly have like, because it's like, you have, you know, it's like, you can't expect the rest of your quartet members to just like drop everything and rehearse. It's like you, you need to, you know, like they have, they have partners, they have lives. And it's like, you, you end up needing to be aware of all of these things. <laughs> but um, yeah, the whole, the whole looking at it as a relationship and not just like showing up and doing your job and going home, I think is a really important fact, like a key, a key factor of keeping a quartet healthy. Yeah, we had someone on chat saying that, uh, posting a quote from Guitar Hero 1, a band is the dysfunctional family you choose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I pretty mean, much sums up the, the panel. <laughs> it, yeah, it really is. And, yeah. and it's, you know, it's funny, it's funny people say that because I actually, there have been things that I've shared with Bideri before I've talked to my family about them, just mm -hmm. because they're always there. Yeah. <laughs> like we see each other all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Or we did pre-COVID <laughs> and post-COVID, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully soon. But I, there was something I wanted to say and now it was like... Yeah. Anyway, I yeah, I just thought of, of, uh, of an experience that I had, a professional experience I had that I wanted to share. Um, and this goes along with the with the tip of like, you know, um, in a way, it is your job to communicate to whoever you're playing with um, that you're, you know, you're going through something or having a bad day or feeling, you know, off or something. Um, yeah, I, I was playing this gig and it was a pit orchestra. And I was very close with most people um, in in the group, um, and I was concert mastering, and like I got to choose my violin section. So you know, I said like, oh, I would love for this one person to be sitting right next to me, and blah blah blah. You know, I had all these very strong players and awesome people, and um, and then it just turned out that I, I noticed the person sitting right next to me um, was was being a little closed. Um, you know, and I, I, I tend to be very talkative if you didn't notice, <laughs> but you know, you know, I would like once in a while try to ask her something and then, you know, she would just like answer very short answers and things like that. And, um, and then during, during the, the whole rehearsal process, uh, and dress rehearsal, I would always like be aware because the whole string section was kind of, um, you know, behind me and, you know, next to me. So like if somebody did something cool like in the bass section or in the cello section, I would always like look back and be like, oh, that was cool. And then, you know, try to re respond somehow or something. And uh, so I was kind of like turning this way all the time. And then it turned out that um, right before, uh, yeah, the, on the last dress rehearsal, this person sitting next to me uh, just said, turned to me and said like, I, I don't want to talk to you anymore. And then that was a huge <laughs> shock to me. And I said, like, oh, my God, like, I definitely I may have done something that deeply offended this person. Um, and, you know, it's like I, this this person from a different country. Maybe it was something cultural that I'm not aware of. Okay, um, let me shut up and, you know, uh, think about it a lot. <laughs> and then, you know, the next day I'll ask again. So. Uh, so that happened and then I went back home and I like couldn't sleep. I was just like, man, what did I do? And then I was like thinking back of all the things that I did, like that I said to her, um, nothing came up to mind. And the next day it was premiere. So the first day of performance, we're, we were performing several days. And, and then I, I turned to her as soon as she got there and I said like, hey, can you, uh, first of all, I'm sorry like that I offended you or something. Like, can you tell me what I, what exactly that I did? Um, that you know whatever and then she turned to me and she said oh you know what you did <laughs> and then i said no i you know i 
I speak seriously very few times in my life, and this is one of them. I have no idea what I did, and it's important to me that I know so I don't do it again. <laughs> Not necessarily only with you, but with everybody else, you know? And then she's like, oh, no, we're about to start. And okay, fine. And then we started. And then, like, we played the first half, and I was in, like, the first half entirely just being like, what is going on? And then... Um, it turned out like in, in intermission, I, I, I said like, okay, you have to tell me, please tell me. And then she said like, oh, you know, you, you keep like looking at me and then you think that you are better than me and you, are, you, you think that you're my teacher, but you're not my teacher. And then like and then all of these things were bursting out of her and, and she was exploding. And then I was just taking all of that in, in shock. And, uh, and to make it worse, the conductor who uh, I've actually worked with him several times, at the moment that she said, um, you're not my teacher, the conductor came in and he said, like, uh, just a second. Actually, here he is your teacher. <laughs> because because it was like okay. an orchestra, you know, it's like orchestra hierarchy, which I think is stupid anyway. But anyway, and then I was like, <laughs> oh, OK, great. That will make things better. So, so it kept going. <laughs> Examples of how not to communicate. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and um, I mean, I, I let her say everything that she wanted. And then also like there was also she was also like frustrated with herself because she couldn't express how frustrated she was, um, you know, in English. <laughs> so sometimes like she couldn't find the words to express the frustration. And sometimes I would like finish the sentences for her. Like I would just like suggest words. And I'm like, I can feel that you're really upset. You know, um, and then anyway, then uh, we kept playing the gig. It was fine. And then only afterwards that um, I had a conversation with the principal second who um, was a little closer to her during during that semester and which I, I wasn't. I was, you know, living in a different town and stuff. Um, and then the principal second told me that she has had a terrible semester. Uh, she was having self-esteem issues. She was not getting along with, with the professor and all of these things that I had no idea. She was having, you know, a miserable semester. And then sitting right next to her was this, you know, cheery Brazilian guy, you know, <laughs> like, can you, like, and then when, when, when he said that, I was like, well, okay, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because it's just like, yeah, I can't think of anything more irritating than somebody completely oblivious to what you're going through in your life and you know and just yeah like going completely against what your you know what your current experience is so anyway that was that was a so, long story <laughs> it was but one thing that i i really liked about it is that you in order to solve the problem you immediately said you were sorry and didn't try to just deflect it Mm -hmm. Because so often, and I think we started with this, like the, the immediate response to somebody saying like, Eli, you're out of tune is to like, be like, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, to just be like, yes, I was wrong. It, those words, if, if people can say those words, like, I know I'll get along with them. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, again, like take accountability for yourself, like saying, sorry, like, I will say don't don't apologize for everything like that that is a problem you can fall into that's true yeah but but when you when you mean it you know to to admit when you're wrong is huge yeah but that's the thing and it, yeah. sometimes you don't you have no idea that you're wrong you know so that's why I, I go like well i you know i don't know every culture in every part of this world so you know yeah i might have might as well just have done something terrible terribly offensive in some <laughs> other culture i don't know you know the i, I don't know it's um yeah it, it's really bad but like the word the, <laughs> like yeah what we used to say here for cheers when you like go and like go make cheers with like a, a glass of whatever wine or beer is is ching ching which like in japanese is a slang for small penis which is terrible so you know a lot of like brazilian people go to japan and they, they go like yay cheers you know and they're like saying this terrible thing and have no idea you know so you know who knows <laughs> yeah i think that sums up the cultural it was differences the first performance. extremely well yep <laughs> so uh we only have one more minute and I know if I start talking, I'm probably going to talk for like 10. Oops. But um, I'm 
I'm I'm going to say this right now. It's still really weird to talk to people from your bedroom and have no idea the reaction you're getting. So thank you for, for bearing with us. <laughs> um, but I mean, communication is something I feel very, very strongly about. And like, I'm lucky. I am so lucky to be in a group with, with people who also feel that way. And I was going to say, uh, please, please, like, if you have any questions or want to talk to us more, um, reach out on Discord or Facebook. Um, I think those are email, any of any of those things. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. And join our Discord with Dairy. Join the um, the VGM Together Discord. Yeah. If you're not already in that one. So. I also want to give a huge shout out to the organizers of VGM yeah. Together. They have done a phenomenal job. And, like, it's so nice to be able to do something during lockdown so thank you <laughs> yep. yeah seriously I think and check out all the other panels like i was looking at the schedule that's pretty great so and community events so there's things. lots of games happening you know people playing rocket league hearthstone and a bunch of stuff <laughs> S spyfall I, I hear whisperings of a mario video where you get to see all our lovely faces again that is something you need to check out tomorrow the team <laughs> that did the video and animation and all the musicians involved were in incredible and that's something I'm so not to be missed. For it. yep and so grab popcorn because it's 40 minutes long <laughs> maybe <laughs> anyway well once again everyone thank you so much for for joining us and Again, Eli and Mateus, I'm the luckiest person in the world because I get to work with you guys. So back at you, for sure. And I can't wait to play with you in real life. <laughs> I know, I know. Soon. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.